Well, I think it's impossible to get us back on track, but uh, Mark was fantastic. Uh, always a, an earth-shaking experience. Um, how, does, how did these machines work? Good. Um, I'm here to talk about global change and foreign exchange and uh, um, what the hell's gonna happen next and how do you take advantage of it. And uh, what Mark said was, um, from my point of view, uh, 85 to 90% correct. Um, I disagree on a few things. You're gonna find out I'm a dollar bull, um, but uh, that's why it's a market. Um, the global background is changing. I mean, unbelievably changing. And, and I think Mark was pointed that out extremely well when he looked at the G7 exports and the, versus um, the emerging world, the consumption of oil. Um, those things are absolutely positively true and it's gonna get worse and worse and worse or, or better and better and better depending on your point of view. And so you should get your point of view on the better side. The developed world is falling apart. Um, Asia is booming. Remember, it's more than 80% of the world population. So, hey, that's a good thing. Um, and something else that's going to happen, um, uh, there are going to be dozens of financial power centers. Um, and that is going to change things around. Western Europe and the United States are going to lose their preeminence in this business. Uh, and that's going to wrench uh, things apart for the next 30 years. Um, well. Oops, I guess I punched, pushed the wrong button. What did I do? I killed this thing. Okay. Um, let's start with the developed world. Um, it's running on empty. Uh, Europe is being hit by uh, multiple tsunamis. Um, I think those are appropriate. Uh, they're pretty awful. Um, basically, the governments have promised too much. A nice little picture of a couple of people pulling a cart full of other people uh, that couldn't fit... Uh, uh, Europe much better than it does at the moment. Um, there's an aging populace uh, added to that. Uh, that's pretty much uh, brought about a debt disaster. That's one of the tsunamis is that aging population. But you throw that together with the Eurozone, which is totally uh, misunderstood, misstructured, impossible situation. It cannot survive. Um, on top of that, Europe has no uh, natural resources. And let's face it, uh, Countries that have natural resources are successful over time. Uh, look at Germany, it's been very successful. Why? Because it has coal and uh, iron ore, or, or did. And that was very important at some time, and that made Germany strong. Uh, the United States was strong for some of those things. Um, now, uh, um, uh, Australia is getting strong for its reasons. Uh, the Middle East is at least a place like the Emirates is getting strong because of its uh, natural resources. Uh, Japan, its ideas have been done. Um, they've been done by everybody else. Um, and so the tricks are, tricks are finished, right? Um, and not to mention the fact that there aren't any people left over there. Um, and uh, you know, the fact that the incoming class in school now is uh, as small as it was in the 1930s um, is a sign that uh, Japan is just not reproducing itself. Um, and uh, the curse of wealth, uh, the currency is too strong, and uh, um, you know, that probably will go away relatively soon. So when you look at the developed world, the United States is the best house in a bad neighborhood. And uh, the neighborhood might be really terrible, but when you're investing in four of the four major currencies in the world are the yen, uh, the euro, the dollar, and the pound sterling. Um, of those four, the dollar is far and away the better. Um, the U.S. is good because it has a growing population, um, guaranteed because we let lots of people into the country. We have no idea how many people are getting in there anyway, um, but the people who come in there are very successful. My son went to the best high school in New York by a mile. You have to test to get in there. 72.5% um, of the people in that school are Asians. 60% uh, of the people in that school do not speak English at home. Um, they put more students into Harvard, into Yale, uh, than any other school in the country. And that's out of 750 kids, that's it. That's the United States, um, and that's the reason why it's the best house in the bad block. Um, they also have natural resources, um, farming. Um, and I think that I agree with Mark Faber says, own a piece of Iowa. Uh, it's full of nuts, maybe, but, uh, but the farming is great. 
Um, let's go back to Europe. Um, something that people don't realize, uh, Europe is much more uh, levered than the United States, almost by 100%, uh, and the number is getting worse or from the European point of view. Um, why is Europe falling apart? And why is this happening to Europe? Um, it comes back to economics, uh, first principles, right? Um, Jan Timbergen won a Nobel Prize for this uh, statement, and somehow nobody in creating the Eurozone figured it out. Um, it's as simple as algebra. If you, have, uh, if you want to find out the value of x and y, or know them, you can't figure it out by knowing that x plus y equals 6. Right? You have to have a second formula, like x minus y equals 2. Then you can figure out that x equals 4 and y equals 2. It's as simple as pi. Turning that into economics is what Jan Tinbergen did. Um, and what, uh, um, what the situation is in, in, when looking at it economically uh, is such that you have three targets if you're running a country, what you want to do. You want to control inflation, you want to keep people employed, uh, and you want to control your trade balance. Um, and this allows you to manage uh, basically your economy. And you have four things that you can move around. You can move money growth, uh, you can move the interest rate, uh, you can move the fiscal policy, how much money you're, you're taxing or taking away and how much money you're giving out, uh, and you can move the currency value. That theoretically is enough to manage your, your country, and if you do it right, it'll work. Uh, it doesn't mean that people do it right. Now you come to the euro. We've taken away money growth, that's controlled by the ECB. We've taken away the interest rate, that's controlled by the ECB. And we've taken away the currency value, that's controlled by the ECB. It's one size fits all. So you're running Spain. What can you do? You can screw around with the fiscal policy, right? That's the only thing you've been able to use. You wonder why people have deficits uh, that are beyond what you're supposed to have in the Eurozone. It's because it's the only thing they can do to try to control uh, the employment situation. Um, and, uh, and obviously that's an important thing. And if you look at the statistics of the Eurozone, every single country in the Eurozone violated the fiscal policy restrictions of the Eurozone uh, in its first 12 years. Um, and Germany violated it three times. So they're not uh, uh, the holiest uh, of the group. But what this means is that that really the Eurozone situation is out of control. And if you take away fiscal policy, which is what the, the new deal that Merkel is selling everybody on, um, the situation becomes even worse. It means basically that the countries have absolutely no control over their future. So um, what's happened? This is why the Euro's got to fall apart. This is the cost of making a widget. Assuming in 1999 that everything was even, um, in Germany now it costs 6% more to make whatever they made in 1999 today. Um, but in Greece, it's 147% more. And remember that in 1999, Greece was not a competitor to Germany anyway. The impossibility of getting these lines back to where they need to go, which is Germany equal, to the other guys is very clear, especially when you consider that Germany is hell-bent to cut their deficit to, to, uh, to strengthen uh, the world uh, of Germans uh, as much as they can. And the net effect is, is that there really is no way um, for the others to catch up. Uh, and here's the solution. Uh, cut the fiscal uh, stimulus that people have had, uh, starve them all to death, uh, I think they're all going to die, um, when what we need is not uh, um, this. We need blood transfusions. We need EPO, the same stuff that the bicycle riders take on the Tour de France in order to get over the mountains. Um, and the hell with that, you know, we're doing the wrong thing. So why is Asia doing this? Uh, Mark Faber is right. The government is much less intrusive, except in China. Of course, China is up 300 percent. This is a seven-year period. Uh, China's uh, exports are up 300 uh, percent. Europe's exports are up 75 percent. Uh, Asia's growing four times faster than Europe. And um, um, the other uh, situation is that if you look at industrial production growth, 
Europe's growth, in fact, over the last seven years is actually negative, uh, down 1%, whereas China's up 13. Uh, the rest of Asia, uh, if you take Asia as a whole, uh, is up about seven, um, and the rest of Asia is up about, about uh, five. So uh, China is the outperformer. Um, where we stand today, uh, China is going into a soft landing. Hmm. I don't know about that either. Uh, and even uh, uh, Ven has, uh, uh, has admitted that it's, maybe it's going to be seven and a half. Uh, but Europe, of course, is looking at a minus two coming up. And if you average out Europe over the last uh, um, seven years, you get a number that's between one and two percent. So the situation in, uh, um, in Europe uh, is much, much worse than anywhere else. Interestingly enough, uh, the money is beginning to show that. This is the IMF chart somebody pointed out to me yesterday. Well, it's very interesting. Saudi Arabia is not counted as being in Asia. But if you, uh, if you put Saudi Arabia as red, uh, the Asians are the top three, and perhaps you could even count uh, uh, Russia as being an Asian power, then it would be the top five uh, people holding reserves in the world would be um, would be Asian. And the first, uh, the first European one is Germany at number 12 and the US at number 17. Um, the way this works in, in, you know, in monetary power is the people who have the money usually have the power. And in fact, if you look back historically, the people who have the money always have the power. Um, the United States, when it went to war in Kuwait, had to get borrow that money from other people. When George Bush, the the latter uh, did not do that. Of course, he sent the U.S. into a into a horrible deficit spiral that we have not yet recovered from. So the situation uh, this is that we're basically looking for banking systems. You know, people with all the money don't have the banks. The financial system in the Emirates, for instance, has to improve. Uh, the financial system in China has to improve. Uh, the Japanese, I mean, we trade foreign exchange with, with 30 different banks. We don't trade with any Japanese banks. Why? Because their systems are so bad that we can't trade with them. Here's a country with all this money. How can they possibly have such terrible systems in their banks that they're ineffective? Um, so, I mean, this is, this is where Asia's got to grow in order to uh, make things work. So, what do you do? How do you invest in this world? Well, one of the problems is, is that equity markets have, uh, um, instead of Japan and the United States dominating the equity markets as they have in the last, uh, I'm sorry, the, from maybe five years ago to, to the 40 years before that, uh, we're getting into a situation where the fastest growing equity markets are not in Western Europe, not in Japan, uh, but outside. Uh, some of those are, are frontier markets. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, those markets don't have the kind of liquidity, don't have the ability to take the funds that perhaps you'd like to invest. Uh, it makes it much more difficult to invest in listed, uh, uh, listed uh, equities. Um, the, only, uh, the only choice, really, then, uh, uh, this is, sorry, I forgot this one. This is uh, my least favorite chart. Um, it's a picture of, uh, in red, uh, the Nikkei from the beginning of 1990. Uh, in gray, the, uh, the Dow Jones from 1929 to, uh, uh, to the late 40s. Um, and the blue is uh, the S&P 500 uh, from the beginning of 2000 to now. Uh, and these are inflation adjusted to make it so that uh, um, they're somewhat comparable. Um, basically, it's a 20-year, uh, you know, deflationary cycle that we have to go through. And I, Mark Faber and I disagree as to how long that deflation is going to last, how long it takes us to get to QE 4, 5, and 6. Um, and uh, that's a real question, right? I believe we have to go through a deflationary crisis first. Um, I think the crisis can be pretty substantial. Um, and then we will go into an inflationary crisis, maybe, right? So I'm only going to put a maybe on that. So one of the, one of the best investments uh, that we see now 
uh, its currencies. And the reason, let's go back to that Eurozone chart. Um, let's say you're Ben Bernanke, um, uh, and let's say you're Rick Santorum, and perhaps the new president of the United States. Um, how do you get the U.S. economy to grow, right? Well, money growth. How much more can you pump up the, the, uh, uh, the Fed? You know, its total assets have quadrupled over the last five years. Um, is it helping? Uh, does that work? Uh, interest rates, they're at zero. Janet Yellen might want to put them below zero, but that's pretty damn near impossible. Fiscal policy, we're running a gigantic deficit now. There's really no stimulation that we can add there. We can slow the economy down. All of those exits will slow the economy down. The only thing we have to, in fact, speed the economy up to employ people um, is the currency. So as, as, uh, uh, as the Brazilians and Mantegna have been happy to say uh, uh, that we're coming into a currency war, um, seems very likely. Uh, and if we're coming into a currency war uh, of the kind that, uh, that we saw in the 70s, uh, certainly a lot of more volatility and fluctuation in the currency markets, a great deal different than we saw in, in 2011, um, basically uh, you have to invest in those. It's, it's a, a currencies really are the ultimate macro investment. It's super top down. It's, it's just a good country or is it a lousy country? You know, it's not a question of whether I'm investing in the equity market or real estate. Uh, it's a question of whether I like that country at all, right? Um, and so, therefore, there's a lot of uh, possibilities. Um, one of the things is everybody in the world is short dollars. Um, it's been a gimme, right? The situation in the U.S. or in the world economy is such that if you're going to build a plant overseas and you need the financing, where are you going to get the money from? Well, you're going to get dollars because the U.S. banks are the dominant banks. They're the ones who have dollars. They're willing to make you the loan. So if you build a plant anywhere, uh, whether it's in Thailand, uh, it's likely to be financed with dollars. And if you're any good as a financial market, you'll say, well, I'm building the plant in Thailand to make uh, uh, gizmos, and, uh, and I'm going to sell them. But why the hell do I want to hedge my dollar exposure and my debt? Because the dollar is going to go down. So basically, we have a lot of people who borrow dollars and they're paying them back at, at absolutely ultimate last moment. You look at the Japanese, for instance, they're doing the same kind of thing. They're investing their, their excess capital in the United States in the treasury market, and they're getting, say, 3 to 4% for relatively long-term paper. Uh, they're hedging that at zero cost because there's no interest differential in the very short term. Um, but uh, if you look at the Japanese players, they're almost all entirely hedged. Uh, so basically, they are uh, very short dollars, um, and, you know, and if the yen begins to weaken, um, they're going to find themselves in a terrible, uh, and it, their hedges, I'm sorry, they're, they're basically long dollars by having those hedges, and if they do that, they're going to find themselves in a, in, a, in a terrible position. Those hedges are exactly the wrong thing. Um, which brings us to another thing. Uh, the dollar yen is likely to get into trouble as well in the, next, uh, in the next five or six years. And these things will upset the world quite a bit. Um, currency also doesn't correlate with anything. Um, these are our results uh, over the past uh, five years, I believe. Uh, January 2009, the last seven years, really. Um, and uh, the markets have been, obviously, this is a slide that doesn't make us look bad. Um, but uh, um, currencies are a good investment. The, uh, the last thing I'd like to do is talk about stores of value. And I think that uh, we have a situation now, which is what Mark said, and which is clear to everybody, is these are the, the central bank uh, asset positions or liability positions, the same thing. Um, as a percentage of the GDP. And, 
And you see the Japanese percentage of the GDP has been quite high because they've been in this deflationary situation since 1990. So in 2005, they actually were, you know, very, very high, and they were trying to lessen the size of the central bank to tighten the situation up. But basically all the other ones in 2008 had to explode their balance sheets to try to create, bring down interest rates, and try to create uh, uh, some growth. And the net effect is, of course, that now they're looking like there's a tremendous amount of inflation that's built into the system. If anybody decides to ever use that money, uh, presently, because it goes through the banking system and the banks are scared of each other and scared to make loans because they don't see anything good out there to loan the money to, um, basically they haven't created inflation yet. But as Mark says, that inflation is going to appear somewhere. So all of, the, all of these big four cu currencies look like hell. Um, the dollar is still the dominant one, although it's declined from 70% in 2000 of the global uh, um, reserves to 60, and the euro has come from, say, 18 to 28 percent in the last 10 years. The question is, would you still invest your money in the euro now, or should you get smart and do something else with it? And choices generally perceived as being uh, dollars, um, but in fact, uh, an interesting issue is this question of gold. Um, as gold goes up in value, uh, it becomes worth more and more uh, on the balance sheets of these central banks, uh, something that they are studiously attempting to avoid. Uh, that's for the major uh, G20 type countries. Um, with gold today at $1,700 an ounce, the, uh, um, the U.S. is covering 4.5% of its M2. I could have picked a lot of different numbers, uh, M0, um, M3, the idea was to try to get something that was comparable. If you look at Swiss reserves, uh, they have uh, $57 billion of reserves, which is a little, sounds good, 7% of the M2 uh, of Switzerland. Unfortunately, two years ago, uh, that number was over 12% of the M2 of Switzerland. And so Switzerland has been selling gold uh, and getting themselves uh, less in the gold market. Uh, but if you were to revalue gold dramatically to $37,000 an ounce, I picked, because it's a funny little game here, that would cover the entire U.S. M2. What's going to happen here? Uh, Swiss reserves would be over 100% of their M2. Um, this would, you know, if you took gold up to $25,000, that would basically mean it was covering all the money. Um, so in effect, you've got kind of an inflationary uh, movement that has to take place here to turn us back into a gold standard. And there's nothing that's to tell us that the world doesn't get into a situation where all of a sudden uh, things are very bad, uh, like they were in 1933 when Roosevelt took the price of gold from $19 up to $35, in effect confiscating the gold, as Mark said, but also throwing all that money in the hands of the people and saying, you know, goddamn it, here's a lot of money, you've got to do something with this. And so, they spent it, and the U.S. began to inflate again. Um, if we have a deflationary situation, despite all of this money being pushed out there, um, creating gold at $25,000, confiscating the gold actually does Bernanke's trick of dropping money from helicopters. The only problem is the central banks haven't figured this out. The top side of this chart is central banks selling gold. The bottom side of this chart is central banks buying gold. Um, and the dark blue line is the price of gold. It's upside down. The central banks are only buying gold when it's really expensive. When it's cheap, they're selling this stuff. Um, they haven't woken up to the fact that, uh, that they actually have something there that's worth it. Now, in all fairness, uh, the Swiss are the ones selling, for instance, and the ones buying um, are the Indians, the Chinese. So in fact, another sign of the West losing its way, right? Not quite understanding uh, what to do. And um, that uh, is, uh, is shown in these commodity uh, prices. Basically, gold is nothing different than another commodity. But in fact, you know, 
It's slightly less erratic. Uh, these charts are, are all done on the same scale. They're logged. Actually, the price of crude, I think, is multiplied by two in order to get it in there. But basically, the same angle of up move would, would imply the exact same price appreciation. And they're pretty damn close. Uh, gold is certainly uh, less volatile than anything else. Uh, crude is uh, the most volatile. And, uh, um, but uh, it's quite possible that we have something other than gold as our, as our standard in the next, say, 10 or 15 years. Uh, that standard might include a lot of other commodities or include a bunch of different currencies, but it certainly isn't going to be the same kind of standard that we have today. So, any questions? I know how late we are, right? <laughs>